Hi, everybody. Firstly, happy birthday, Julian Assange! Happy birthday! Um, I, I come with a message, firstly, from our colleagues who have been, our comrades who have been gathering in Parliament Square, and specifically from Stella, to say how grateful she is that you are here today, standing by Julian. So thank you very much for being here. The other message I have is on the phone. And this is a message from Ray McGovern, who has worked in the intelligence for decades, who was um, a senior advisor at many stages to those in the very top levels of power. And Ray has a message for his good friend, Julian, and for you. So I'm going to play that first. And I hope you can hear it. I'm going to put the uh, phone as close to the mic as I can. Can you hear it? Oh. I'd like to start by quoting Julian's brother, his brother Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel spoke at a major press conference uh, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. on June 30th. Uh, that's, that was Wednesday, uh, four days ago. Here's what Gabriel said. In Washington, we stopped at the Jefferson Memorial. And one thing that really struck us there was one of Jefferson's writings where he said that he was forced to choose between a government without newspapers and newspapers without a government, he would choose the latter. So he would choose, Jefferson would, newspapers without a government. <laughs> Now, the powers that be in the United States have not chosen that one. They've chosen the former, a government effectively without independent newspapers. In effect, we have a, a government without a free press. Now, witness the fact that at this major event at the National Press Club in downtown Washington, been there so many times, you can count them. Uh, there were no mainstream media journalists there. So, the National Press Club and no mainstream journalists? Hmm. No members of what I have called the, the fawning corporate media? Actually, as an aside, uh, it's an acronym, FCM. Uh, go ahead, pronounce it quickly with the C is a C, is a hard C, F C M. <laughs> yep, yep. That's how I feel about them too. <laughs> now, are you shocked that there was a big event at the National Press Club and no one came? There was a party and no one showed up. Well, get this. It's worse. A whole week has gone by without any mention of the confession by so-called Ziggy the Hacker from Iceland, that he made up the accusations that the U.S. Justice Department used in its superseding indictment of Julian. You see, they desperately needed someone to manufacture evidence in order to avoid what's widely known as the, quote, New York Times problem. Uh, in effect, how can you prosecute WikiLeaks? and not prosecute the New York Times and other media who publish the same material. So, this story, Ziggy the Hacker. <laughs> Last weekend, it trended on Twitter. And with WikiLeaks itself, Ed Snowden, Glenn Greenwald tweeting about it. Well, we all tweeted about it. Has it appeared in the fawning corporate media, the so-called mainstream media, <clears throat> no. As one media watchdog put it, uh, such a blatant and juicy piece of important news should have made worldwide headlines. But instead, as of Friday, July 2nd, yesterday, there has been literally zero. Nietzsche, nada. 
no coverage of it in the corporate media. Not one word in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, NBC News, Fox News, or in... I'm not sure of this, but I've been told that papers in the UK have also been biting their collective tongue. But here's the thing. Uh, the charges against Julian for hacking in Iceland, the, the charges that the Department of Justice thought would allow would allow it to prosecute Assange and circumvent the, quote, New York Times problem, those charges now have no foundation. Uh, they rest on admitted lies. The superseding indictment falls flat on its face. Absent those made-up charges, well, here, here's how the deputy of the New York Times stated the problem three years ago. His, his name is David McCraw, and this is what he said publicly, quote, Vassage would be a very, very bad precedent for publishers. He's sort of a classic publisher's position, and I think would have a very hard time drawing a distinction between the New York Times and WikiLeaks, period, end quote. He's sort of publishes position. Well, yeah. So, by their current silence, uh, I'm, I'm thinking the New York Times and media have made it clear uh, that it is they, pure and simple, that are tools of the government they are the centerpiece, the cornerstone of what I call the Mickey Map, the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, all cap, media, think tank complex, far more complex and far more powerful than the Mick that Eisenhower talked about. So today we face a far more complicated conundrum than the one Jefferson spoke of. It's not a choice between newspapers and government. The newspapers government and the ruling circle, so to speak. The Mickey Man, if you will. The government and the media are one. That's dead. That's dead. The government and the media are one. Okay, maybe you can... Well, I will post Good this day. online for you to listen to. I'm sorry you couldn't listen to the last... It's only got a minute left. And, sorry. Thank you. I'll post it online so you can have a look at it. I'll put it onto the Wise Up site uh, via Emmy and others. Um, I, Yes, Emmy was right when she said that I only joined this in about 2019 when I came to... Uh, this meeting that I thought had been organized either by WikiLeaks or their associates, journalists and lawyers. And I realized that it was a bunch of ordinary people who recognized the crimes of the state and who weren't going to sit down and say, it's not my problem. And that was a powerful message. So. And that powerful message for me meant a very important thing because two people in this gathering today gave me 20 pounds each to help put on an event and we started the Free the Truth series of events in London to allow ordinary people to understand what Julian has done for the world. And I'm going to just summarize some of the things he has done. At a time when we had media controlled by oligopolists, a very small number of people who were very powerful and who could control what was in the media. And we also had a new cycle that was changing from being in print to being online, to having a very short news cycle and to, ha to having information that people were only willing to listen to for a small amount of time. And therefore, journalists being under huge amounts of pressure to put out more and more stories during the day, which means the quality of their research went down. And they were, they were only allowed to speak within an acceptable range of opinion. And Julian changed that by doing something that somebody who was embedded, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, who was embedded in the same battalion 
that engaged in the collateral murder killing didn't report at the time. And this is evidence from Chelsea's testimony, which shows that they knew what was happening. Patrick Coburn, the legendary journalist himself, has said that quite a lot of what was going on in Iraq was known by the journalists who were on the ground. Mm -hmm. But they did not have sufficient volumes of proof to be able to take it back and have it discussed elsewhere. And here with this change in technology, both within the media and within the intelligence services where you're using computers now and there's a lot more data to hand over, it's very difficult for a whistleblower to communicate that data. And Julian created a, a life-changing, a, a world-changing solution, which was WikiLeaks, where vast quantities of data from, data from whistleblowers could be communicated such that the whistleblower was secure and safe, which was really important, because not all whistleblowers need to be like Chelsea Manning or Craig Murray or Edward Snowden and make themselves known. They might be ordinary people who want to do the right thing, whether in Belmarsh prison as staff or whether in the courts at Westminster or whether in the courts at Old Bailey. These are all ordinary people who know that a stitch up is going on and who want to tell us the truth. And if you are somebody who has a family member in a care home, if you are somebody who's worried about maybe your family in Iraq or Afghanistan or in other parts of the world, world getting bombed on false premises, if you are somebody who cares about the environment and are worried about toxic waste dumping off the Ivory Coast, for example, something that WikiLeaks revealed through the Trafigura dump, or if you are somebody who knows that a 14-year-old boy is held in Guantanamo and it is you know, you know this Islamophobic prison that Guantanamo had, which was about 980, around that number of prisoners, all Muslim, were held under horrendous conditions, tortured, beaten, sodomized, sexually assaulted. One of them was Mohamedou Ultslahi, a Mauritanian. If you have ever met Mohamedou, you will know that he's this funny, engaging, charming, highly intelligent, highly thoughtful, very kind human being. And if you hear his story of being sexually assaulted, you know, tortured, told that his mother would be hurt, these kinds of things he was told for days on end. People were rectally force fed peanuts and pasta at Guantanamo. These are the kinds of horrors that were taking place with people as young as 14, right? And this is what we revealed through WikiLeaks. This is what Julian revealed and Kristen and all the others who, whose names we don't hear every day, but they had the courage to use their intelligence, to harness technology, to bring together whistleblowers and to bring together journalists, not just the spineless big journalists of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian who were willing to cooperate with WikiLeaks when it suited them and then ran away with their tails between their legs, but also all those little newspapers in various jurisdictions, for example, in Tunisia, where Julian's work, the work of WikiLeaks, helped spark a revolution. This is why Julian is, is persecuted in Belmarsh prison as he is now, this is why he is psychologically tortured and he, smears are put around that he tortures his cat or that he smears feces on the wall or that he is this and that he is that and that he is arrogant. But of course, the reality is a peace-loving, highly intelligent, highly capable, hugely knowledgeable journalist is locked up in Belmarsh prison and the people who look over him, who watch over him, for the state are complicit in this torture unless they stand up and reveal the truth of what's going on where they put him in medical isolation because somebody took a photograph not because he's struggling with his mental health and i i say the word mental health that's a falsehood right because if you stamp on somebody's head as the states of britain america ecuador australia and sweden have done and then call it mental health issues it's not. Just like if I stabbed you, it wouldn't be a physical health issue. It would be assault. 
And this is what the states have done. They have assaulted Julian. And they have done it in plain sight while the mainstream media stays silent. And it is us who are coming together. You should be very proud of yourself because you have come together. You have chosen to stand here and say we will not tolerate this injustice. It is a grave injustice. And it is an injustice not just to Julian, but to the truth. The truth is what we need to know if we are, have, if we are to have a better world. And it is through Julian's work, through Wikileaks, that other journalists have been inspired to do brilliant things. For example, when we had the Panama and the Paradise Papers come out, telling us about the leaks and uh, about you know the, the money that was held offshore by so many billionaires who were hiding their assets, they used a technique pioneered by Wikileaks, which was the secure Dropbox. That They used a technique, another technique that was pioneered by Wikileaks, which was the use of multiple news media so that a story wouldn't go unnoticed just because some journalist in a top organization was too cowardly to say anything. And or that some journalist in a top organization didn't care because it wasn't a big enough story for the world. They worked with local partners and international partners and they ensured that the data was 100% accurate. This is WikiLeaks's, uh, uh, you know, fantastic uh, achievement. The data is 100% accurate. And Maxine was right. It should be the war criminals, the polluters, the corrupt who should be in prison. And it is shameful that Judge Taylor, Judge Snow and Judge Barretta have engaged in this process while knowing that, firstly, the way in which the extradition treaty works bars politically motivated extraditions. Secondly, Julian is a journalist who revealed the truth and journalists engage with whistleblowers to reveal truths. Thirdly, that the US, which is the prosecuting power, have spied on Julian inside the Ecuadorian embassy, spied on privileged conversations, which should have caused this case to be thrown out. And that the FBI have relied on the testimony of Sigurd Todorsen, who is a convicted pedophile and scamster. Knowing all this, it was heartbreaking for me to stand outside the Old Bailey at four or five in the morning, along with people whom I see here, who very kindly stood in the queue for some of us so that we could go to the loo or we could have a space because they would only allow two people into the public gallery in the morning. And then later on in the day, they, later on in the process, four week process, right? We find out that three of the seats were reserved for, you know, senior diplomats who didn't turn up. Finally, we got five seats. You know, in the afternoon, we would suddenly get a couple of seats. This is shameful, given that the galleries, both between them, had 66 seats. Even with social distancing, they could have allowed more people into the gallery. These kinds of stitch-ups which have been going on are being pursued through a police complaint which has been made for misfeasance in public office against the three judges who were involved, one of whom after Julian had said his name and his date of birth, pronounced that Julian was, an arrog was arrogant or thereabouts, you know? This kind of misuse of the process, misuse of power, is unacceptable in a democracy. Yeah. And we stand together to say, Happy birthday, Julian! We Happy are with birthday, you! Julian. Happy birthday, Julian! We are with you! And I have one final message from Margaret Rapner. It's only a text message so it won't get disrupted by the noise and it says your band of supporters in the US is doubling down just as we will uh -huh. we are with you on your birthday and we are here until you are free free Julian Assange thank you Support independent media. The best way you can do that is to like this video, comment down below, and give it a share so other people can see it. Thanks.